Um, so I'm Touring News, or Brad, uh, if everybody wants to introduce themselves really quick, and then I'll do your introduction, Professor Keen. Okay. I'm Canadian Populous Left, or my name's Tom. You also call me Tom. Uh, also a streamer on Twitch. I'll pass it over to Nate there. Uh, another uh, SBTV underscores where we stream. Uh, my name's Nate. Uh, talk a little about economics, environment, uh, these kinds of things. So I'm um, really happy to be here and, and talk with Professor Steve Keen again. This is a, a nice treat, and I hope everyone enjoys it. So without further ado... Yeah, and um, yes, uh, Steve Keen is an Australian economist and author. Uh, he considers himself a post-Keynesian heterodox, uh, criticizing the neoclassical economics as inconsistent, unscientific, and empirically unsupported. Uh, Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis forms the basis of his major contribution to economics, which mainly concentrates on mathematical modeling and simulation of financial instability. Professor Keen has written Debunking Economics and Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Among Professor Keen's most well-known quotes is, if you look at mainstream economics, there are three things you will not find in a mainstream economic model, banks, debt, and money. How anybody can think they can analyze capital while leaving out banks, debt, and money is a bit to me like an ornithologist trying to work out how a bird flies whilst ignoring that the bird has wings. One of the main areas of research of Professor Keen uh, has been focused on throughout his career has been the accumulation of U.S. private debt, which is one of the reasons we've reached out for the conversation today. Professor Keen and his work can be supported by purchasing one of his books or subscribing to his Patreon. His community has encouraged him to offer most of his work for free in order to keep the general populace informed, and the monetary donation is mostly for solidarity. It does include Discord access, debunking economics audiobook, a weekly podcast, and a few other benefits, all for $1. Have we missed anything, Professor? Thank you very much for that. That's actually one thing I would need to clarify because I've seen. So thank you, thank you. I've seen so often people yeah. think that my Patreon posts are you know behind a paywall. They're not. The, the podcasts are because I actually do those with a professional podcaster, a very good friend called Phil Dobby. He has to make money out of it, so he gets ten percent of my Patreon revenue. Uh, but apart from that, everything else pretty much is fantastic. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's that's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, take it away, guys. Go ahead. After you, CPL or uh, Nate, go ahead. Sure, I'll launch this off here. So uh, just out of curiosity, which, looking at COVID-19 right now, which countries do you think are handling, handling this properly, if any at all? Uh, pretty much the Southeast Asian countries, Taiwan in particular. Uh, I mentioned you guys are all taking a look at the John Hopkins database. Mm -hmm. Have yep. you seen yep. that one? Okay, I regularly look at that. I'm, trying to, I'm actually building a software package I call uh, Ravel. Uh, which is intended to, to analyze multidimensional data like uh, like, like uh, the data we're getting on uh, on the COVID-19 disease. Is it ready yet, unfortunately, for release, but uh, I'll be able to do a time, pardon me, a time series of uh, the data you're seeing from the uh, John Hopkins database and also enable people to you know, choose which country they look at and do comparisons and that sort of thing. But if you take a look at the data itself, I'm trying to bring it up right now so I can take a look at Taiwan, which of course is right next to China, has a population of the order of, I'm not sure that you are popular, but it's just the 20 million mark. It currently has 376 cases. I'll let that sink in. 376, okay? You compare that to any comparable European country, you're talking about 100 times as many cases per head. Uh, so it's clear that Taiwan has well and truly uh, contained the growth of the virus. It is still rising. If you take a look at it, it was uh, very, very flat until early March. Then it rose, but it rose from 50 to 400 cases. So they and it's, it's tapering already. So if you want to learn from any country, learn from the Southeast Asian countries, in particular Taiwan. What would you say they've done differently that has made their response be better than that of, you know, potentially Europe or the United States or other countries? Uh, well, firstly, one, this doesn't apply to all of them. Of course, Taiwan is a, somewhat of an exception. But heat and humidity helps against the virus. Uh, we know that it, it starts to chemically break down at 56 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's, vibe, it's only people, but I don't know how many people realize that viruses aren't technically alive. They're parasites which only function inside a, a, a host, in our case, mainly humans, and uh, also cats, as we're finding out. Uh, outside the body, it, it will degrade over time, and apparently it's, it's got a very thin layer of fairly weak lipids or fats and various other... That's what formed the actual corona. And temperatures above 25 degrees Celsius uh, start to break it down more rapidly than those below 25. 
So if an average temperature of where I'm currently in Southern Thailand, I'm here deliberately because of the virus, the average and maximum daily temperature in the shade here is 37 degrees. Uh, that oh, means the temperature, the temperature on the pavement is 56 degrees plus, and it won't last in the sunshine. So that's, that's a major environmental factor in their favor. But apart from that, they had experience with SARS. Mm. And, uh, and they also, of course, it, 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 there's also experience with excessive pollution. So there's no social stigma attached to wearing masks. Now, you see all this garbage coming out of uh, Western leaders saying, oh, masks don't really work, don't wear masks. What they're really saying is, oh, dear, we don't have enough of them, even for our medical workers. So we don't want you general public taking away from medical workers. So until such time as we produce enough of them to cover the medical staff, we're going to tell you they don't work. And we've, literally, I've forgotten which particular you know, Europe, United States bureaucrat, <coughs> pardon me, is responsible for this. But he was literally one of people telling people not to make masks. And now there's a video of him showing how to make your own mask. <laughs> oh, goodness. It's yeah. just, just ridiculous. So yeah, they, they were aware of the potential for a pandemic. They had experience with the epidemic of SARS. They therefore have a, a practice of wearing masks. They have sufficient... Um, uh, ventilators and things like that for a reasonable scale epidemic, not a pandemic, but they had those already. They manufacture the bloody things. Now, of course, this is another thing. The West has uh, happily relocated production from itself to the third world to take advantage of low wages. And guess what that means? It means the third world has the production facilities and the West doesn't. Mm, yeah. So, so on top of that, there's also the, the social, uh, relative social distancing here. It is not a habit to shake somebody's hand here like Boris Johnson did uh, to those, you know, I mean, God almighty, I feel sorry for the guy, but, you know, just takes my breath away. They went around shaking the hands of corona victors, of uh, the coronavirus victims in hospital. That's really good. That's really good political sense. <clears throat> so the Asian pose is, is to the, the time in particular the, the bow. Mm, yeah, uh, you don't make physical contact as much. You wear masks, and, and therefore the practice of being physically separate is much more common. And where I am in southern Thailand right now, pardon me, I'm actually coughing for the first time. I don't like that. Oh right. no, yeah, <laughs> great bloody timing. But anyway, um, in in southern Thailand, they are the local uh, uh, local food outlets. A, a number of them they're distributing up to four masks per person per day for the principal sum of ten baht. Which is about fifty cents. So, so did you say that? Wears masks here. Did you say that's through the grocery stores and grocery chains? So that's something that you can like pick up at multiple different places. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the one we use is actually across the road from us. Um, so they're, they're making enough masks for their population to have a supply of masks per person, and the masks do prevent somebody with the disease transmitting it further. It's, it's a physical barrier. Uh, it also does prevent, to some extent, you breathing it in. Of course, the masks. You know, I mean, if I can show one of the masks here, I have yeah, a ludicrous sure. supply of them. Okay. That's a surgical mask, not a, not a proper mm -hmm. industrial one. If I whack that on, I can fit it over the nose, but obviously there are gaps here, there are gaps here, you know, something's going to get in, but it reduces the, the, the quantity you're likely to absorb and therefore you um, don't take in as many as you would in the West. Here's the, here's the typical item you pick up for 10 baht or 50 US cents. There's four of them inside that pack. Um, so all those practices uh, mean that they are already at a mechanical level uh, preventing the virus spreading as much as we are in the West, as, as the West is. Uh, and also there's more of a social conformism here. You accept the state has to be strong. This mm. in many ways, you can date it back to the historical event of the irrigation that is necessary in monsoonal countries. You have to have irrigation systems to control the rain. You can't just rely upon it falling out of the sky nice and slowly like it does in the UK. Um, so therefore you needed a strong state to build the irrigation system. That goes back 2,000, 3,000 years in all these countries. So an acceptance of a strong role for the state is much more common here. Put it all together and that's why the countries that actually were the first ones to experience the virus are the ones with the lowest case incidence. There you go. Are there, so, I was gonna say, did these, so you said these countries had experience with SARS, are there any sort of early warning systems <clears throat> where they kick into uh, effect much faster? I mean, it took for, I, I mean, living in America, it took them forever to actually finally make the call. And, you know, it just, it started out with like state to state initiative yeah. rather than it being like a federal, uh, you know, mandate or anything. So did they 
I'm thinking of something like a not quite analogous to like a, an early warning system for tsunamis, but as soon as something was sort of happening in China, once like word got out of it, did they immediately, you know, start these social distancing or equivalent? Oh yeah, straight away, and it was both it was both the individual level and the social. So I mean, I've, I've read just read I think a New York Times piece about the absolute travesty of the way that both America and America uh, slowly woke up to the fact that this was serious. The UK is even more embarrassing. I mean, it's like a like a bad skit of Yes Minister uh, when you read how they say so low for example, say the danger was low, then it was slightly low, then it was slightly more than low but not quite moderate, then moderate. I mean, for <laughs> God's fucking sake, this is serious, guys. Yeah. Um, so, so as soon as it was obvious that, that there was an outbreak in uh, China. Uh, that was about three weeks after it, uh, after it was first identified. The Thai authorities in particular were onto it and you know, reducing traffic from China, um, starting to advise people to start social distancing. All that stuff happened very early here. And if you take a look at the, the, the I mean, I know the Thai case very well, but that's where I chose to move, partly using the fact that my partner is Thai, but also because I was looking at the data for them. Uh, Thailand... Uh, began with the second highest number of cases outside China. It now is about number 35. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. I, mm. I'll, I'll be quick with this one. I don't want to stay on COVID response forever, but there was a specific thing about the United States that I would like to ask. Um, we today had a primary take place in Wisconsin. What would you say to world leaders around the country who are saying not only it's okay to have an election, but I think that you should go out and vote? When Donald Trump was asked a question during the press conference today by a reporter, the reporter said, do you feel that you have any kind of responsibility because you were encouraging people to go out and vote? And he completely sidestepped the question. So what would you say to world leaders who are encouraging their people to continue to go out and put themselves in these situations? They're criminal. There you go. Yeah. Okay, they should be going. That that is literally telling people, why don't you go yourself? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the last thing you want is to stand in a queue uh, for hours, as it takes takes to vote in an American election, uh, exposed to other people who probably some some of whom almost certainly have the virus, given the density of cases there right now. It's literally criminal behaviour. And not only that, the governor tried to stop the election from happening and postpone it. The judiciary stepped in and said, "No, you can't do that." So they they went from having a 180 polling places, I think it was, to something like five or a handful. So five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Mil in Milwaukee, they had about 150 polling locations, and they closed all of them down to five. So now you're forcing people to be in an even longer and longer queue. And then also, I yeah. found that it was very interesting that the Wisconsin Supreme Court said that it was unconstitutional for the governor to suspend the elections, but then the Texas Supreme Court, in a different ruling, said that during times of immediate stress or like national security mm -hmm. constitution can be kind of like pushed aside at the moment. So like, yeah, different courts in the United States have different rulings. Um, CPL, mm -hmm. yeah. if you'd like to take it more to like the econ side, what's on your mind? Yeah, for sure. Well, I just want to do one more as we transition out of COVID. Uh, I know that in your book, Debunking Economics, you have a really great section uh, kind of debunking the whole myth that no one saw it coming with the 2008 Great Financial mm -hmm. Crisis. Yeah. Uh, now with COVID-19, we hear a lot of talk about no one could have seen it coming or this is a black swan or something yeah. like that. So, so what's the reality going on with COVID-19 in relation to no one saw it coming? Uh, total garbage again, like everything else. Uh, on this front, and I, I just want to find uh, one uh, paper I, because I, um, you know, my area is complex systems modeling, and uh, as, as part of that, um, I also want to get into multi-sectoral modeling of the economy because the neoclassicals pretend that there's a single consumption good, uh, you know, spam that we we, we eat, we drive in, we sleep, we make love to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're totally ignoring the multi-sectoral nature of production, which actually used to be part of neoclassical economics back in the 1950s to 1970s or 80s, before Lucas came along and trashed the whole damn thing with his stupid real business cycle models. They used to do what they call computable general equilibrium. And, okay, I don't have any time for the equilibrium side of that, of course, but this is using technology developed by Vasily Leontiev, who's a very non-orthodox mathem Russian mathematical economist, uh, input output analysis. So you can say what inputs are necessary to produce which outputs. You then produce a matrix of, in, of data saying these are the various inputs and the, the ratios needed to produce one unit of output of a particular commodity. 
Now, you can use that to say, well, let's identify the commodities which are absolutely vital or enable us to have a successful lockdown. Obviously, we need food, we need power, we need sanitation, we need water, et cetera, et cetera. We, we don't need, we don't need uh, uh, hair, 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 you know, hair tonic, okay? et cetera, et cetera. There's something you can leave out completely. We don't need cars anymore. We just stay with the current stock of cars. So you can identify the commodities you need it and then say, okay, which, given those commodities which we need and the quantity we need of them, what other sectors are necessary to produce those inputs? Okay, et cetera, et cetera. And you get a pattern to say what's actually necessary. Now, blowing, blowing down, I went searching, <coughs> pardon me, in the academic database and found an article written in 2010 by Santos Orsi et al., uh, 2009, pardon me, with the interesting title of Pandemic Recovery Analysis using the dynamic inter interoperability input output model. This is in 2009, okay? I'll quote the opening of the part of, uh, article. According to disease control experts, a pandemic, an infection that spreads widely and affects a significant proportion of the population is inevitable. With the rise of new infections such as SARS and the avian flu, experts from the General Accounting Office believe it is imminent. That's imminent that's and that's inevitable. Now. 2009. Now, I, I, I knew before reading that, the work of a woman called Laurie Garrett, who was the, uh, um, the uh, health correspondent for the New York Times. And she wrote a book in 1994 that I read in 1995 called The Coming Plague. Mm. Okay. And she identified that given the nature of the pathogens, and particularly by, by bacteria, but also particularly viruses for us, um, they evolve along two primary dimensions so far as we're concerned. One is transmissibility and the other is, is, is virulence. Now, normally with an evolutionary process, if you dramatically enhance one axis, you're likely to dramatically reduce the other. So an increase in virulence goes over the reduction in, in transmissibility and vice versa. But it's inevitable at some point evolution would roll the dice and it'd be one vi uh, virus which would get both an increase in transmissibility and an increase in virulence, and that's SARS. Mm -hmm. So we have a warning from 1994 mm -hmm. saying this was inevitable. Yeah. Uh, and then you look at them more recently, look at when this thing actually started, people like Chris Martinson were picking up on the on the Chinese data way, way early. I'm, Chris is a, is a friend of mine. He writes what's called the Peak Prosperity blog. I do recommend you guys get him on as well. And Chris was warning of this from early January or late December. So I've been following this thing since then. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, the, yeah. The bullshit that it couldn't be anticipated. <laughs> One super yeah. fast thing to throw into here. Did you hear anything about Project Aura in the United States from a New York Times article that came out about a week or two ago dealing with ventilators and the 2008-2009 response from the United States at all, Professor Keene? No, I didn't tell me about that. There <clears> was <throat> um, there was an HHS um, governmental program that spun out like uh, a communicable diseases plan, and they wanted to develop ventilators at $3,000. There was a $6.4 million contract awarded to, I think it was like Newport, some company in California, a very small company, niche company that was working on the ventilators. They developed a prototype. They delivered the prototype. It was about to go through like different phases of testing. Covidian, the big pharmaceutical manufacturer, bought out the smaller company, claimed to the government they weren't able to produce the goods at the price that the government wanted them at, said that they needed another $1.4 million grant. They got the grant. They then canceled the government project. The government then invested another $14.8 million with Philips to produce ventilators to put into our national stockpile. Those still haven't been delivered now in 2020. So for 12 years, the oh, United God. States has known that they've been trying to get these ventilators to put into the national stockpile. And, you know, you let a leverage buyout take place, you let another corporate takeover, you let another consolidation of power. So I, I thought that you might like to hear about that story from The New York Times from recently. Uh, tragic. I mean, it, 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 it's you're watching ideology destroy society fundamentally. Well and America is, is, America is built on the ideology of independence and freedom. The virus yeah. couldn't give a shit about independence and freedom. All it wants is, just to, is, is, is to uh communicate with each other, get as close as possible as it can pass from one body to another. It couldn't give a shit whether socialists, capitalists, fascists, Marxists, doesn't care so long yeah. as it gets from one body to another. And in that situation, you have to say, well, we've got to think like a virus. We've got to do the opposite. And in that situation, the whole idea of freedom, independence, et cetera, et cetera, will get you killed. Well said. Well, this is, and just sort of tying Corona in with the economy a little bit, I have like sort of two semi-related question um well one is 
we're in very interesting times. I guess the silver lining of this is we're going to see what happens when you have a massive disruption in supply chains and a massive disruption in demand. Yeah, um, what happens? Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. you know, so we have, we can talk about how 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 might you think this would play out in the, the short, medium, and long term. And the other question would be, um, I've seen a lot of interest lately in talking about death strikes. And I think you've talked a little bit about how yeah. doing what is necessary to survive is the last thing we should be doing is trying to prioritize the rentier uh, classes and their little payments. We need to actually figure out, you know, how how to get everyone through the crisis, right? I mean. So, so should people do be looking into something like a debt strike or absolutely? I mean, the, I mean, most Americans haven't got enough money to cover one one um, one month's rent payment or one month's mortgage payment anyway. True. Uh, if they if they lose their job, and we know that ten million have already filed for unemployment claims in two the last two weeks, it's probably going to crack twenty million this week. Um, certainly between fifteen and twenty million people. Uh, that means there's fifteen to twenty million people who've got enough money to pay slightly less than their rent. For this month or their mortgage for this month don't pay it simply don't pay it keep that money aside to buy food uh, to you know pay for your internet subscription because you're going to go stir crazy suck back at home if you don't uh, all the things which are basically necessary to survive complete isolation and if you don't do it uh you think the landlord's going to send around thugs to evict you just tell the folks you've got coronavirus inside the house. That shouldn't stop them. There so, you go. I, I have a very big yeah. question about this one because I've been I want to take like a big part of my days and like work on the organizing nature of this. And what I was thinking is the best way to organize a rent strike would be calling different apartment buildings, trying to get one or two tenants within the apartment, and then bringing them on to be a part yeah. of trying to you know trying to get that entire apartment building. What would be some other ways that you think? Because we can't go out and meet in the streets. We can't, you know, have like a big picket yeah. or a big protest. How else would you encourage people to begin organizing the rent strike, the mortgage strike, the private debt strike, the student loan strike, the medical bill strike, the credit card strike? I think, well, I think the point is where it's got to be done on, on a, on a uh, residential basis. Uh, we, most of us know at least one of our neighbors. It's one of the awful things about human society is that we 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 used to be very very close to the people who are physically very close to us. That was the basis of human of Cro-Magnon societies until we got into the uh, went out of the hunter gatherers stage and got into agrarian societies. Now we're completely dispersed. But you know at least one of your neighbours in each building. So if you have a chain reaction and say, can you please spread this email to other people you know in the same building? and let's get together and let's all decide not to pay the rent, let's all decide not to pay the mortgage, then that that's like a, an electronic version of the type of physical get-together we'd normally do to make a decision like this. As the entire building says we're not paying the rent, we're not paying the mortgage, uh, I think that might be something that gets the finance sector to put pressure on the politicians to actually do something because they're going to ignore the little people. But if the finance sector starts to scream, then they'll start saying, OK, we've got to provide cash by government created money so that the little people can pay our pay our, um, our rent our bills and pay our mortgage bills final little quick question do you think the twelve hundred dollars that they are giving to uh, i'll call it a broad swath of the united states population is just a check for the landlords or do you think that it's actually designed to you know try to like stabilize people how much is an average how much is an average rent in a city like uh, chicago Month. I live in Philadelphia and I have a two bedroom apartment that's around fourteen hundred dollars a month. <laughs> You'll know, slightly less than necessary to pay your rent, so it's not enough. I mean, it, it, you should be paying enough that the average person can pay the average rent and keep the average family and food for the month. That's pretty much the minimum. So I'm thinking something of the order of three thousand dollars a month. Wow. Okay. If you're doing well, that much well. money, then then you'd be able to you could continue paying a rent a rent bill, you continue paying the mortgage, you could put food on the table, which should be delivered by the postal service rather than you going out shopping for it. Um, that, that would be feasible. So something you order of $3,000 a month would be more realistic. Where, how, how will they pay for all these uh, direct <laughs> transfer payments? <laughs> how, how are we going <laughs> to afford it? Oh, my goodness. One, one number in one account and another number in another account. And if the numbers are equal, they can do it. It's accounting. This is what, I mean, it's so frustrating watching uh, you're having been saying for you know in my case for about 15 years in the case of win godly about with you know with win died about 10 years ago but uh, a few decades bill mitchell randy ray stephanie kelton's scott yep. furwell uh, 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 uh i'll be forgetting all my names here but all the modern monetary credit saying for a long time money is simply an accounting operation 
creating money is adding an asset on one side of a bank's ledger or a government's ledger and a liability on the other side. You've created the money. It's not, it not you can't create it. It's what are the impacts of, of that creation on the actual economy. Now, at the moment, if you don't create it, the economy will disappear. That's the impact. So we simply have to do it. And we can see it's how it affects real resources too, because in well before the coronavirus, you had stupid things going on like uh, uh, fracking for gas and oil in the United States that was primarily financed by very cheap access and easy access to to credit to these industries that were in negative cash flows for for many years. And but the the point was this financial operation. I mean, this is through private banks and their version of money creation. But we were just digging up resources you know, like like gas and oil and we were exploiting those things when maybe we shouldn't have been right. Like this is, oh, I yeah. think, cause we really care about whether, what resources are we using and where are we sending them? Right. Like that's what we, we should be worried about. Not the actual nominal number. Yeah. The, the right. nominal thing. Is, I mean, it's, it's a crazy how economists try to conserve nominal stuff uh, and, and are happy to, to rip off the physical real stuff as if there's no consequences. You have this, you know, we, got, we must save government money. We can't run a deficit. Oh dear, the debt for our children. And let's dig up everything on the bloody planet and pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and pollute the skies. And, uh, and you know, that, that's nothing wrong with that. I mean, God yeah. almighty, talk about an inverted set of priorities. This Speaking is, of austerity, this is actually uh, Margaret Thatcher died this day uh, a number of years ago. This is the anniversary. So uh, wow. ironic. Is <laughs> One of the final things that I'm going to want to ask tonight and then CPL and Nate are able to take over. We kind of did like switch over a little bit to like an oil discussion now. And it's been something that I've kind of been trying to take care of. And I know that you're a very environmentally active person, uh, Professor Keen. So I've been trying to look at I think we're at around a 30 percent reduction in global oil demand at the moment. I've seen predictions mm -hmm. that by the end of April, oil storage is going to be 90 percent capacity, including floating tankers all around the world. There's the mm -hmm. war going on between Saudi Arabia and Russia at the moment. There's the OPEC meeting that might be taking place on Thursday. And my personal opinion is tourism and international travel or even domestic travel isn't really going to return to any type of stable levels until there would be a vaccine or a significant level of antibody tests, I would say. So mm -hmm. how is, I guess, oil, one, not going to collapse upon itself? Two, are nations going to have to bail out their oil industries? And three, what is this going to mean as we do transition to sustainable economics or sustainable energy or anything? There's a lot within this, but well, I guess yeah, it's, yeah. What, what are you thinking about like oil and renewables at the moment right now in the current climate? Well, I think this, in, in some ways coronavirus is a wake up call on climate change in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why when I read my one of recent pieces, I, I said that there's a correlation between the two. And that's because they're caused by the same factor, and that's an excessive human pressure upon the planet. Uh, so if you look at neoclassical economists like that twit idiot uh, Nordhaus, or that <laughs> sociopath Richard Toll, Richard Toll. Uh, they, they have reduced the whole thing simply to carbon dioxide. That is not the only thing we pump out into the biosphere. Uh, it, is quite, it is the most obvious, but it's not the entire spectrum. So if you look at the entire spectrum, we are loading up the planet in so many ways that the coronavirus... It obviously occurs in us as a peak predator because there's no point in uh, infecting Siberian tigers because they're dying out. So we've, we've brought this upon ourselves. And coronavirus, is, is, is a, it's a surprise that that's the very first element of climate change to really kick humanity in the collective balls. But it, it should be taken on board immediately and said, OK, what level of what load are we putting on the planet and, and can we sustain that load? And the answer is far too much a no. So this should be the start of a reversal, going back to the stage where we drastically reduce our consumption. We start identifying what's necessary and what's not for survival of the, not just humanity, but the other species on the planet as well. And in that situation, the amount of global travel we allow, and I'm a, I'm a great center on that front because largely because I travel around the world, I did, uh, talking at conferences about the insanity of neoclassical economics. Uh, that has to stop. Not just my, not my, my trips, business trips have to stop. Uh, tourism has to pretty much stop. All these things have to go into reverse to reduce our load on the planet. Population growth has to go into reverse, frankly. Uh, there's an enormous number of things we need to reverse. And in that situation, oil, um, uh, the whole idea of, of the pumping out oil and using it in the volume we are now, that has to end as well. So, um, in that sense, the oil price is on a tick party to nothing to go to zero. 
or close to zero, certainly below economic levels for the fracking industry in the United States. Uh, we have to conserve and use the oil that we have for sensible reasons. Plastics being part of that as well as some uh, sort of socially vital travel. And that doesn't include business trips. It doesn't include politicians going to sign free trade deals. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 we're, we're lucky in some ways that this virus has hit us first because the, the level of breakdown we're likely to face through climate change change over time will come through so many uh, myriad ways. Most, most scientists I, I know who work in this area talk about, they say death by a thousand cuts. Hmm. Now, when, when a fabric falls apart and it's by a thousand cuts, you can't actually tell what the hell is going on. Coronavirus, we know specifically what's happening. So in some sense, that's raising our awareness about the need to pull back our load on the planet. But it, it is coming in some ways 50 years after we should have taken notice of studies like the limits to growth. And that to me is a great tragedy. We, we, we had 50 years that we could have prepared for this. Instead, we quadrupled our load on the planet over that period of time. And now the planet is biting back. Yeah, wow. So I, I just wanted to ask in terms of uh, the St. Louis Fed <clears> recently <throat> came out and said, we might be looking at like 30% unemployment in the States. I know that last time the highest in the states was something I could be wrong on this 24.9 roughly during the Great Depression. Uh, what what are your sort of uh, feelings on what's going to happen with 30 percent if we have it, or even if that number is accurate? Uh, what kind of response can we expect from the federal government? Will they sort of just sit there, or will something kind of uh, come out through the pipeline? I think most likely it's going to be shock through the financial sector that gets them to wake up because uh, they they sort of think they don't they don't have any real understanding of the economy as a complex system. Uh, or as a, as a monetary system to begin with. So they're not even aware of whether you have a 30% fall in employment, you're probably going to have about a 25% fall in demand. That will mean that corporations that are carrying the highest level of corporate debt in the history of American capitalism, as they are right now, will be unable to service their debts and they'll start going bankrupt. When they start going bankrupt, the banks that lend to them will start going bankrupt and the financial system will collapse. And, yeah. and that's, that's why you've simply got to provide the financial flow to households and to corporations, small companies, to enable them to pay their rents and pay their mortgages. Otherwise, it's good night the economy. Well, is there a risk this will turn out in some way like 2008 where you had this quantitative easing, which succeeded in inflating asset or you know the, the, the values of equities without really touching or fundamentally changing you know, in a positive way for your average working person, you know, the, the real economy. Do we have this uh, threat now with coronavirus or with COVID-19, um, just the Federal Reserve basically doing? I mean, I, the, from what I've seen, the, the, I, I see Janet Yellen out here asking for the ability to go and buy equities directly from a stock market. I was just about to bring I that guess, up. I guess kind of like, yeah, like a Bank of Japan move, right? Yeah. So, um. If that's the case, I mean, are they just gonna they just care about the S and P five hundred, and they're gonna let the rest of the economy figure it out, or? Well, I, I don't think they can this time around because I mean, the unemployment during the Great Recession rose from about four percent to ten percent over a period of about about one and a half years. We're talking going from three percent to thirty percent in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Okay. So it is it is a totally different experience. This is literally a unique experience in the history of humanity. Uh, and if you go back to the last time that a pandemic hit us, it was back in 1918. It was during the end of the Second First World War. And it was when there was a military provision of goods. They suppressed the news to some extent, the same way they're doing it right now. It was mishandled to some extent like it is right now. But the, the level of complexity of the supply chain then was nothing like what we face today. So the Model T Ford was being made in America pretty much in the one factory. It needed yeah. steel and rubber and stuff like that inside there. But, you know, you could still produce the Model T Ford from uh, using inputs from factories up to about 100 miles away. The, the Apple iPhone, uh, there won't be any being made right now because there are 43 countries involved in its production and none of them are allowing exports or imports. So the, the shock to the supply system and the shock to the demand is far beyond anything we've ever experienced before. And it's still taking these guys a hell of a long time to wake up to the, to the scale that means. And therefore, they simply can't just you know, try to pump the S&P 500 and think that's going to solve the problem. Um, and, you know, I, I, want, I want to see direct government purchases of shares, okay, to make, because the, the finance sector is not going to buy risky assets right now. Uh, but I want those shares to be distributed to the public after they've been bought. Mm. Now, that, that ain't going to happen with the current political leadership. 
Yeah. So well, actually, do you, will you finally be able to? Can we use this as ammunition now against these uh, Ricardians out here? Who, whenever you talk about free trade or uh, multilateral trade deals or whatever, you know, can we finally say, well, I guess you can't just outsource everything because literally, look around you. I mean, we we can't produce certain types of necessary, absolutely fundamental equipment. Is this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, this, this, I mean, you know, you guys know comparative advantage. And the simple reason it's garbage is that if you read the definition of economics which Lionel Robbins uh, developed in the 1930s, which is founded to some extent on Ricardo's vision of uh, capital mobility, it said economics is about the allocation of scarce resources to un uh, unlimited, uh, the allocation to unlimited wants of scarce resources which have alternative uses. Okay. Now, I'd like one of you to tell me what is the alternative use for a blast furnace. If you're not going to make iron, what else can you do with a blast furnace? Can you make a cup of tea? I mean, it is <laughs> okay. It is just ludicrous to talk about capital yeah. being mobile between industry sectors, and that's an essential part of Ricardo's theory. If you have if you have autarky, which is the initial state that's really bad, and then you liberate to have free trade, which is the usual neoclassical vision and also part of Ricardo's, then you simply reallocate resources from uh, uh, the labour-intensive sector in one economy to the capital intensive and vice versa. Bullshit. You can move labor from one factor of industry to another to some degree. You cannot move in the machinery. So the whole idea that there are gains from trade specialization is just nonsense. It's confusing monetary capital, which of course is fluid, with physical capital, which is not. So that's the, uh, the basic flaw in the theory of comparative advantage. And then I've got to have a go at modern monetary theory here because I'm a great supporter of modern monetary theory when it's applied to the money itself. But it has this nonsense idea from Warren Mosler's Seven Deadly Frauds uh, that the, um, the, free, the trade, trade is, a, is a net benefit if you're an importer. It's better to import than to export. Okay? That's nonsense because what it leaves out of the fact if you actually are somebody who sends over pieces of paper and expects to get goods back, that will happen when you're not in a crisis like the coronavirus. As soon as you're in that <laughs> yeah. crisis, you can keep your pieces of paper. Okay, we're going to keep the ventilators. We're going to yeah, keep exactly. Them up. Okay? Yeah. You undermine your own physical productive capability when you need it. It's a nonsense idea. It should be driven out of the modern monetary theory. Um, and and we should be looking at again the model we should have for production should be a biological model because we are fundamentally a biological entity. And we're now the coronavirus is teaching this big time. Production should be organised in such a way that you have as as small a region as possible, producing as much of its needs as possible. And then you, okay, if we had that sort of system, then the world would be organized into a series of different cells, where if a disease broke out in one of those cells, it spread to another cell would be limited. And instead what we've done, we've completely eliminated all barriers. We've gone being like being like, you know, a, a multicellular body to this enormous glob, uh, where if the disease starts in one part, it's going to go through the entire globe, and that's what we're seeing now. If we had a biologically organised production system rather than a neoclassically organised one, the virus's spread would be much, much slower. We could have contained it in one or two or three of those cells. Instead, it's taking over the whole planet because we globalised production. Since you brought it up, I was curious to know, uh, <clears throat> when it comes to MMT, uh, you demunked a little bit. So what, what parts of MMT are true and what parts are wrong? Or, and, and, are, and are there any parts where MMT doesn't go far enough or something like that? Yeah, MMT is correct on money for creation. Okay. Okay. And the, the fundamental idea that they're saying is, uh, is that money is fundamentally a double entry, a creature of double entry bookkeeping. A bank, crea a bank creates money by saying uh, that you know that that idea of buying that house is a great idea here's a million dollars to buy the house by the way you owe us a million dollars mm -hmm. that's how it creates money the government creates money by running a deficit okay if the government spends money it spends money more money than it gets back in taxation and it finances that by the central bank effectively buying the bonds the treasury sells the bonds to the finance sector the central bank buys the bonds off the finance sector that creates money as well and, the, and, and that vision is correct. Now, they have overemphasized the importance of the government side and underemphasized the private banking side. Um, and I can quote Randy Ray on this at some point saying the whole endogenous money idea is trivial because uh, all endogenous money is realizing that banks create money. 
all it did was change what you, the central bank tried to control. Rather than trying to control the quantity of money, it tried to control the price of money. That, and I'm, I'm not critical of Randy here because not everybody can have the same insight, that ignores the role of credit in creating additional demand. And that's been my focus, showing that new credit money creates, even though it doesn't create net financial assets, new credit money does create new demand. And therefore, the ups and downs of credit demand are essential. That should be integrated with MMT. If that's done, it will strengthen MMT. The point where it's garbage is this whole thing over international trade. And that gotcha. comes from what they, 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 you know, I know Warren's a nice bloke, okay? uh, but Randy and, and Bill Mitchell should both have taken on and said, Warren, your ideas about money are completely correct. It's true the government takes tax to spend, it spends to tax. That's correct. Your ideas on trade are nonsense. There's no such thing as opportunity cost uh, in international trade. Opportunity cost is an individual thing. It doesn't apply at the collective level unless you have full employment, which we know we don't have, therefore it doesn't apply. Uh, and, and the whole idea that trade deficits are a good thing is something you can't globalize because the sum of all trade deficits is zero. zero you're saying yeah. running a trade deficit is a good thing, then you're for anyone running a trade deficit causes somebody else to run a trade surplus, which is a bad thing. It should be banned at the international level, even if they were right and they're not, they're wrong. Um, so the whole international trade thing should be thrown out and MMT would be drastically improved by getting rid of it. Could you also, just for the sake, for our audience, break down real quickly the difference between endogenous money and exogenous money? Yeah, the idea of exogenous money is the idea that the government is in control of the money supply. So the government is seen as being creating money by you know, running a deficit. And, they, and then the, the mainstream will admit that if the government runs a deficit, that creates money because they, they pay more money into the, if you run a deficit, the government is putting more money into the private bank accounts by spending than it's taking out of them by taxation. So the amount of money in private bank account goes up. So that's, that's the initial idea of the government creating money. Then the, uh, the model of fractional reserve banking, which is a total myth, but it's a myth <laughs> yeah. that mainstream textbooks believe, that then says, well, for every $1 created, if the government tells the banks they have to hang on to 10 cents and could lend out the other 90 cents, then over time that $1 will create $10 via that money multiplier, which is another myth. So that's the idea of endogenous money. Now, endogenous money says, well, the system itself can create money. It isn't the case that the government has got a, a physical problem of the amount of money, you can move it you know, forwards or backwards, which is what you'll see in textbooks, the idea of a, a vertical supply of money on, a, on, a, a, on a, a graph used to derive the ISLM model. It's vertical because it's, that's not affected by the market system, that's set by the government. Now, endogenous money was first interpreted saying, well, in fact, the banks can create money by lending out more than they get back in repayments. So bank new lending exceeds bank repayments that creates additional money, pardon me, mirrored by an amount of additional private debt. <clears throat> but it was a burp rather than a cough, so I'm rather <laughs> pleased by that. Um, no worries. And so endogenous money says the banks create money. Exogenous money yeah. says the banks can't. That is a total myth. And like, I, I've been part of a group of non-orthodox economists going right back to Basil Moore, the late, uh, late and great Basil Moore, who first wrote the paper called The Endogenous Money Stock in 1979, saying that banks create money. And with Mark Lavoy and Louis Philippe Richon and Andy Ray and all these people as well have been saying this, Stephanie Kelton, for decades we've been, oh, no, 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 you've got bloody well talking about. It's the textbook. The textbook is right. The Bank of England came out in 2014 and said the textbooks are wrong and effectively radicals like myself are correct. And they actually told yeah. me that face to face, by the way, because I know the authors of the book <clears throat> for the report. So we know banks create money. That's what endogenous money really says. And I prefer a different term. Endogenous money is something that only insiders understand. I yeah, call it, yeah. I call it bank originated money and debt. That's with a beautiful, right. ac beautiful acronym of bond. So we lived in a bond economy. Yeah. Bond economy. That's brilliant. There there was something you said a little bit earlier on that kind of like caught my attention when Nate brought up the Janet Yellen putting forward that, you know, the Fed might have to buy equities and something. You said yeah. you were in favor of the government purchasing equities, but in the interest of the people or like shares for the public. So I kind of have like a multi-pronged question of, do you think that there should be some level of maybe 
nationalization or what all maybe say is non-profitization of certain sectors that could be you know held in trust <coughs> by the government for the populace and as well how would you feel about uh, trying to democratize like the board um, so there have been I know Germany like puts uh, workers directly on the board of directors of companies Elizabeth Warren in the United States had some proposals for it Bernie Sanders had a proposal of 45 percent of workers on the board of directors so how would you feel about some of these things as being like shifting the balance of power to the public and to the worker yeah they're, they're quite sensible projects which other countries I remember as a student in 1971 or two being set a book review called a modern capitalism, uh, I've forgotten the author's name right now, but uh, Schoenfeld, Andrew Schoenfeld. And in that, he explained the, the basic flavors of, of capitalisms around the planet. And one of them was the German system. And I remember vividly the Germans' uh, uh, board of German companies has what's called an Orfestrat. I'm pronouncing it wrongly, I'm sure. I have German <laughs> listeners will correct me. Orfestrat. And that is a worker, worker management board. Mm -hmm. It's always been part of German, German capitalism. You had the board of directors and the authorship board, which had a combination of representatives from the management and from the unions. And they were involved in negotiating both not just pay levels, but also workplace arrangements, uh, investment, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one reason why Germany outperformed America. <laughs> Interesting. Okay? So, so uh, it is not uncommon around the rest of the world to have workers having representation and even customers having representation on large corporations. And it makes plenty of sense. It gives you more feedback. And it doesn't just give you this you know, narcissistic MBA mob taking over the countries and, and basically uh, you know, pillaging them, which is what we've seen uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, in, anything which gives more, more involvement in corporations is a sensible thing for a straight, strict capitalist economy. But there are also sectors you need to have nationalised. And um, that doesn't have to be entirely nationalized, but for example, medical research, for God's sake, <laughs> we shouldn't be held to ransom for virus, for antivirals and vaccines. And yeah. in, in Americans said the government can't do it. We guys, the government put a man on the moon back in the 1960s, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah. So it's, it's feasible. You simply you need to have a realization there are some things which are better done in a centralized way and some things better done in a, in a disaggregated way. So, for example, my favorite example of things that should not be centralized is food at university. Mm. Centralized food, you get bloody awful food at university to bring in all <laughs> the, the small holes and stuff like that. Yeah. Medical research, yes, some have some corporations competing for it for sure, but have a, a, a publicly funded, well-funded research center and distribution center. Health should be public, 100% mm. public. 85% yeah. Australia's got a great system called Medicare which the Conservatives have tried to destroy for the last 40 years, was put in by the Labor Party back in 1972-73. Uh, but that it has individuals pay 15, up to 15% of the cost of, of the medical transactions. The state covers 85%. And that is probably the most socially defended element of the Australian society. Uh, that Medicare system works perfectly. I, I went to have an MRI scan because there was a problem with... Um, I think it was one of my wrists. I can't really remember. Okay, it's, it's a yeah. trivial thing. To go. It cost me five hundred bucks to have an MRI that day. Okay, yeah. in America, what would it cost me? Fifty thousand. <laughs> a yeah, lot. Yeah. To be determined. A lot. Yeah, we will know for sure. But I'm just doing a time update, and then CPL and Nate, you are in charge. I was imagining you were probably going to stay with us for about an hour. It seems like we have about fifteen minutes left if we were going on that timeline. Okay. So. So I was going to say, like, do you think, um, I mean, given the fact that our political establishments basically across the globe are subservient to uh, a, a very <laughs> empowered financial sector, and yeah. we may talk about MMT, but, you know, the MMT is used for the backstopping financial Ponzi schemes rather than regular people. It, it, do you think that we should look for alternatives? Like, should we be trying to democratize our workplaces like uh Professor Richard Wolf talks about, like, should we be looking for cooperatives? What, how exactly do you think? I mean, do you think there's a place for more democracy in the workplace, or you think there's? I mean, it sounds oh, like you're yeah. saying like the, 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 the most important thing is putting finance back in the box. I mean, you know that I've been campaigning for modern debt relief for about a decade now, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because we let the financial sector get to be at least three times as large as it needs to be. The American financial sector, uh, after this, after the Great Depression and the Second World War. Uh, it was rep represented about 30% of America's GDP in terms of the debt to GDP ratio, 30 to 40%. It rose to 170%. That's 
that's about four times the size that it needs to be. Damn, and all damn. that did was put larger financial charges on American workers and corporations. And as Michael Hudson points out, it's largely the cost of real estate and the cost of debt that makes America uncompetitive with the rest of the world. I'm here in Thailand and I, I can get a really good meal. And I mean, I mean a good meal for about two bucks mm -hmm. or three bucks. Okay. Um, and the reason is the person who's paying, making that meal for me is only paying like a, a trivial level of rent for the house. So I'm living in a four bedroom, two story uh, house, a large, well constructed house in a gated community three kilometers from the center of a town of 60,000 people. I am paying 300 US dollars a month. Damn. Wow. Okay. Now, <laughs> a streamer, house, the workers, streamer house in Thailand, everybody, let's get going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's why I've got a reason I knew I could have. Okay. And like, you know, it, it, I should give you a bit of a camera show around the place. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think the bedroom, I'm, one of the four bedrooms I'm currently working out of is about uh, into American terms, about 18 feet by 12 feet. Wow. Okay. There's, it, 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 it's huge. How much does it cost me? 300 bucks a month. Now, because of that, and like you, you, this is this is luxury accommodation here. Uh, people will be paying 100 bucks a month. They pay much less rent. That's why they can get much lower wage. That's why they outcompete you. So the finance sector has crippled America. It hasn't strengthened you. It's crippled you. Mm. So the finance sector has to be right under control. Um, Yes, we need more more direct personal involvement inside our corporations as well. Uh, you know, democracy, Americans talk about democracy and they ban it in one place that matters, which is the workplace. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you yeah. live in a command upon it. Actually, even Paul Samuelson talked about America being characterized by rampant capitalists and a cowed working class. So you, all, the, all the crap you talk about democracy, you actually practice fascism inside the workplace. And your best functioning companies, the ones where there's actually a sense of democracy, a sense of involvement, as tough a boss as Elon Musk is, it appears that his companies are like that, that people actually want to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's that, that passionate feeling of involvement that is part of what makes a corporation work. I'm starting a small company. I'm working with people who are passionate about being working with me on the software. So the whole idea that it's anti-democratic in company points out how, how asinine the version of democracy America practices truly is. Well, uh, America, is, wow. it's strange because, you know, there's, there's one half of them, they're, they're buying guns because they think the government can't protect them, and then the other half is buying guns because they think the government's going to go too far, <laughs> you know, with their, their, the pandemic <laughs> response. It's like, you know, You live in a schizophrenic country. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking yeah. about, CPL? Uh, I was wondering about... I know that you've been, uh, myself as well, but you've been obviously against stock buybacks. Uh, now okay. we're looking at things like Boeing. Uh, we saw Boeing recently come out. They took out a whole bunch of debt, bought back on stock. We see all these companies blowing up now looking at bailouts. So uh, what what do we see now with stock buybacks now that uh, reality has sort of asserted <clears throat> itself? Well, that's actually, that's, that's the capital market destroying capital. That's what's been going on. It's yep. all been inflating the earnings of MBOs. This is the whole neoclassical idea about shareholder value and the idea that to get the managers to align their interest with the shareholders need to get them rewarded the same way. That's given you the three-month period of reporting cycle, outrageous salaries being paid to top managers. And the result is corporations which are asset stripping themselves to en enrich the, the top managers and then some of the shareholders rather than produce goods and services. I highly recommend getting in touch with a guy called Blair Fix, by the way. Have you heard his name before? No, well, I'll definitely Google that. I will definitely Google and take a look at Blair, that. Blair has done one of the most brilliant. I was actually one of his examiners. And he really, he actually said you can't explain income distribution in the world uh, on the basis of contribution and skills, which is the neoclassical idea about marginal productivity theory. So the only explanation is hierarchy. The bigger a hierarchy, the further up the hierarchy you are, the more you get paid. So we have a hierarchy-based income distribution system. And that hierarchy uh, is, is where these managers have come from. And the, 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 they've been enriching themselves. Um, they, they might as well have been you know, taking money out of your pocket. It's, it's the carpetbagger mentality of America again, rather than genuine managers. So get rid of stock buybacks. Uh, and that, that's one reason I think we can actually use quantitative easing for the people uh, as, as a way of buying these shares now, which are going to put value anyway, 
to stop the banks going bankrupt because if they have too much of any of these shares in their books with the plunge in share value will cause the banks to go bankrupt, which you don't want to have. Buy them at the state level, but then they get redistributed to people uh, to give you a level of, 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 you know, of, of people involved in capitalism. What Louis Kelso used to call uh, the capitalist manifesto, something of that nature. Well, I, I've seen these kind of the quizzical, quizzical is the only way I can say it, these justifications for buybacks. I've seen arguments that say, well, the company doesn't have anything left to invest in. So what they're going to do is they're going to take this money, return it to shareholders, and they'll, you know, it's like like a form of altruism. Like, well, they'll figure out something else to invest in. It's like, really? Like, I guess, like, capitalism's over then. There's no more capital to buy, no more research and development to do. They just, they, they can't use this $40 billion or anything else. They have to do share buybacks and let the, the shareholders invest in other things. Like, I, I've heard these kinds of, to me, they sound ridiculous. It sounds like, you're announcing the end of capitalism you know, at that point, but yeah, no, let's go back to the household. Obviously. Corporations too. I mean, give me a break. Can you repeat that? Sorry, you cut out. I so, just, yeah, one sorry. more time, just cut it there. Okay, just saying the whole idea that you know you've got to give it money. Corporations can't work out what to do. <sighs> yeah, you starting to cut in and you actually uh, froze I've really in the just video cut out again. Oh, froze. We, oh, we got C froze for a sec here. We'll have uh, Professor Kane rejoining us in just a quick moment, but yes, your it video. Oh, there we go. We got you back. Oh, now. back. Okay, good. Good, good. Sorry about that. Yeah, good. No. yeah uh, it, 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 it's such bullshit coming out as justification for self-interested policies by people at the top of the social and political hierarchy. It's the it, time we should call, you know, go time out on these nonsense ideas and one thing we should actually get rid of is neoclassical economics completely if anything has failed it's neoclassical economics it gave us it encouraged us to globalize production which set us up for the virus it gave no warning of the financial crisis in 2008 it, it destroyed the skills economics used to have to handle input output analysis which is one way they could have contributed now it's a useless waste of time we should retrain them all as kindergarten teachers. <laughs> so, uh, hey, this is a good question, actually, because people ask me all the time, like, what, what should you, what, what, if you were wanted to learn about economics, where should you start? What books should you read? And I never want to give an answer because I, you know, I don't feel like I'm an expert. Yeah. If if someone's going to ask you that question, and they said, well, where, where can I start with useful analysis, useful economic? Where can we actually? What's a good point to, to build on, if not like the your your standard canon that has led yeah. so, so many astray? Well, then, you know, of course, I could put forward debunking economics, and I would. I'd actually say that if you want to do the positive approach to what economics could have been, it's actually a book that's out of print, but I've put it up on my website by a guy called John Blatt, B L A W T. It's called Dynamic Economic Systems: A Post Keynesian Approach. John Blatt was a Austrian-born Australian uh, resident pure mathematician mm. with a ferocious, ferocious intellect. And he was invited along to a seminar by a guy, a guy economist who's been specialized in trade theory called Murray Kemp. Murray's a lovely human being and a great tennis player. Uh, Murray invited John along to give it to a seminar of Murray's on international trade theory um, because he regarded, Murray regarded John as his only contemporary because they'd both been nominated for the Nobel Prize. Uh, Murray in economics and John in physics. Anyway, so John is famously rude. And when Murray finished giving his talk, Murray asked him over the top of the audience, head of the audience, you know, what did you think? And John replies, and this, that's not a quote, I wasn't there, but I heard it heard recounted by many, many people. That is the greatest load of rubbish I have sat through in my academic career. <laughs> if, this is, if this is what passes as economics, there's something seriously wrong with your profession, and I intend finding out why. <laughs> he then sat down for three years and wrote one of the most economic systems. He wrote it for non-mathematical people to some extent. Then he put the mathematics and appendices and the verbal explanation from the body of the text. It's probably the best explanation I can think of to give you a positive orientation to economic theory. So go to my website, profstevekeen.com and search for uh, Blatt, B-L-A-T-T. I, I haven't. Okay, that's the book I'd recommend, and then my book, debunking economics to realize why everything else they teach is nonsense. I'll try to there make my yep. question short here. 
Um, I heard you mention earlier that like tourism needs to be completely changed moving forward, and we're going to have to drastically cut our tourism back. And I've heard you say many times that you know federal governments aren't constrained by budgets, but state governments are. So the question that I wanted to ask is, what's going to happen to regional economies? You know, I'm kind of thinking maybe Italy, Greece, Portugal, or different places of tourism, even Thailand. Um, as far as like their budgets are going to go in kind of like the new age and how are they going to be able to survive? And also, how are the United States individual states going to survive because their budgets are being absolutely destroyed right now and I do not trust the federal government to take care of them well enough? No, I'm afraid I feel the same way. I mean, um, America could go through one hell of a, a cataclysm over this because if you do actually start starving the states as the feds have been doing, then... Um, you know, the states are going to potentially try to break away again. You could have a civil war coming out of this, and I'm not joking. If you look at another great book called Ages of Discord by Peter Churchin, T-U-R-C-H-I-N, he says the level of social discord in America before this crisis hit was actually only ever matched by what happened during the civil war. So, you, you know, you, you really do have a big danger there. Uh, countries which relied upon tourism, some of them actually had too much of it. If you look at the Italians in Venice, they want to get less... Amsterdam used to live and still have a house. Uh, they uh, find tourism excessive. So we need to, the cutting back drastically on tourism uh, can be compensated by those com countries increasing their production elsewhere. And it's, but it's going to be a huge shift. This, the world after coronavirus is going to be nothing like it beforehand. So the whole idea that we should go back to what happened beforehand is, is I think, uh, beyond naive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, CPL, I'm sure you have a few questions left over. We're about at the end of our time, so we'll try to just maybe ask like one or two, do a little wrap up. And Professor Keene, if you have any questions for us, I mean, we're not really the ones, but um, we, yeah. we're just, we're so happy that you came, you know, to share yeah. like your insight with us. It's really incredible. Look, uh, just tell me how you guys came about the learning about develop the non-orthodox views you have. Uh, mostly uh going through just youtube videos and eventually you came up on the the role and i saw you uh, uh i think it was bloomberg with a leather jacket and i was like <laughs> who is this dude showing up on bloomberg with this leather jacket like what's going on here and and <laughs> and it and it just it was great symbolism because it, it showed like you're not with the mainstream in the sense mm. like i got that right and then i ended up googling looking at other things and other videos and a lot of the humor so seeing you on red again inc and that sort of thing i'm like oh damn well, yeah. i'm gonna get i'm gonna get steve's books got the books and i've been a, i've been a patreon supporter for about a year oh, now you. chilling in the discord and uh, I always, I'm always waiting for that new YouTube video to come out or whatever. And you you have really great content as well on your YouTube. Thank you so much for uploading all those lectures. Uh, I've gone through most of them. And uh, yeah, that sort of just helped me out uh, understanding you know, economics is not a monolith, you know? And there's and all sorts you. of different, yeah. uh, different lenses. Yeah, I, mean, I really wrote the monkey code. I think I'd like to solve some of the light that have had that impact. Awesome. Thank well, you. Yeah. For me, uh, I think my... We first saw you, like me and my brother, um, years ago. Like I think it was on Max Kaiser in 2011. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is like a long Max time ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then, so, but and after that, my brother really started getting into economics. He found your channel on YouTube and started going through all the lectures over and over and over and over, like doing all the work. Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, an idiot with my little, you know, my econ 10, my econ 101 and 102, <laughs> you know, what I took in school. And then he's like, everything I would bring up if we're talking about economics is like that's totally wrong. You know, he'd just be, you know, busting my every idea or you know everything i put forward so it was a combination it was the uh it was you know media you know it was i guess modern media and then it was like finding the uh like your youtube basically and which are which i highly recommend for everybody because you can go get a college level education for i mean yeah better than a college education actually better than college yeah. education yeah mm. Mine was just, um, I was a caregiver for an elder gentleman who was a journalist in Washington, D.C. for a while, and it kind of got me somewhat interested in doing some level of journalism, and I couldn't get a job in a newspaper or anything, so I started a stream for myself yeah. where I would just read newspapers and books and everything over time, and then I met these two above me, and they've kind of been my economic mentors of, you know, helping me kind of like get everything down and learn everything, so it's just been, it's been an amazing learning process that we all kind of have here on Twitch. I think all of us have had our channels for about a year at this point now. Uh, yeah. and, and doing the yeah. broadcasting and the streaming. So good stuff. Well, guys, keep it up. You, 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 you're one of the hopes of the future. <laughs> thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you for your content. Uh, keep releasing that content. I love getting all of it. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been really really good. Do we have time for a couple more questions though before we before we hop out here? Just a few. If, if you maybe well, have. I'll, 
Go ahead. If yeah. you maybe have one or two, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, want one. I guess one quick question. Uh, just in terms of specifically on Canada, I know Canada likes to brag a lot about how like incredible its banks are. Our banks are so special; no one can ever touch our banks. Could you maybe uh, maybe give us a little bit of a debunk on how the uh, banks aren't the most the Canadian banks aren't like the this exceptional thing that descended from the heavens? Oh, you guys have been conned with the same way the Australians have been on the planet. Um, when banks create money, uh, that, that, that credit money is spent into the economy. If, even if it goes on real estate, it ends up hitting the physical economy as well. You've continued going forward, partly because of your mineral exports to China, but partly also because of the... And mm. your, your whole, entire economy is not as, not as fully based upon house price bubble as Australia is, but it's a house price bubble that hasn't burst yet. That's what you've got in your favour, mm. and it's not in your... <laughs> Yeah, Could you thanks. give us a sneak peek, just real fast, a sneak peek into some of the research you might be working on, especially yeah. when it comes to that'll, the environment? Like, that'll be a good way. If you, yeah. if you incorporate something like energy, like the, the idea of uh, trying to account for the uses of energy in our economic systems? Yeah, so. I mean, I, I, about three years ago, a four-year insight that let me solve the energy and economics question, and that was that in, uh, labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy <laughs> is a sculpture. And I therefore, you, you can't say production is labor, combining labor and capital. Uh, because without energy into both of them, you can't get any work done. So that's that's what was the initial insight. Now I'm working with Matthias Priscelli, who's a fabulous Canadian mathematician, Brazilian-born, you know, based in Hamilton, and Tim Garrett, who's a, a brilliant atmospheric physicist based in the University of Utah. We're working together to try to extend that insight. So we've done work uh, converting what's called the Goodwin model of uh, cyclic growth, which was the basis of my Minsky model, converting that and being based on energy. We did that in our last meeting. And next meeting is coming up next week, obviously by virtual means rather than face to face. Uh, and we intend adding matter into the analysis as well. So we have a from first principles analysis of production involving matter and matter being transformed by energy. And then going to a multi sectoral model of that so we can finally build a, a, a Oh, we lost Professor Keen once again for just a moment, but his internet will return uh, in a couple of seconds. It's just we're, sure we're we'll making calls 10,000 miles away from one another. Yeah, we are far. Absolutely. And once again, everybody, if you can go to Steve Keen's Patreon, we have linked that in the channel. We've also linked the Twitter. We've also linked the website where you can find the books and everything as such. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, anticipating Professor Keen returning to us. Paul Krogging must have hacked the signal. <laughs> yep. you. Yeah. Ah, if, okay. If, if you guys froze, you guys froze for a while, so sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, we're back. Good. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the most fundamental thing I'm doing right now, and then I'm also working on a third and final edition. Wow. So I nice. hope to start. That. I hope to start that uh, in about oh, two months, and the final thing I'm writing a cartoon book on money called Funny Money. <laughs> and that's that's with with a great card cartoon it's called Miguel Gear and Miguel and I did a book called Econ Comics together. Which I've actually I've sent my, my on my Patreon page. You go looking for uh, one of the most recent posts. I've given away for free Econ Comics. Oh, okay. I'll be checking that out then. Hell yeah! Yes. All right, and I'm tr I'm trying to get raise funding so I free as well, which I need about to cover Miguel's cost. I need about about. A bit over ten, about ten thousand US dollars for one each of three volumes. If that can get sponsored, then we I can give that away for free as well. Um, but that's going to be explaining the monetary system from the point of view of three redneck, um, uh, red Republican billionaires called Tom, Dick, and Harry, <laughs> as, as, they, as they try to make the monetary system behave the way they think it's going to find the things aren't quite so simple. Great, Hell yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for all of your time. Would you just want to like shout out your Twitter, your Patreon, your website, where people can find you, yeah, and sure. then um, really just once again thank you for everything. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my my main my main income these days comes www.patreon.com slash prof Steve Keen, all one word. Um, it's most of the posts there are free, as I say, and I get enough money from people now to keep myself alive, so I'm not touting. For extra subscribers, though, of course, I'd appreciate them. But I, it's really getting the ideas out. That's where I publish most of my. So, www.patreon.com slash Prof Steve Kane. Um, my Twitter handle is Prof Steve Kane as well. And I have a website which I'm, I'm, I have really haven't maintained properly, also called Prof Steve Kane. 
So those are my my three main my three main outlets. And then look for debunking economics. And um, my next my next major work, which is going to be um, a book called uh, Economics Economics Matters for Cause for School Students, which um, is going to be a strange one to write during the coronavirus lockdown. Uh, yes, right. thank you. Enjoy your afternoon, Nate. If you'd like to say goodbye, some CPL. Uh, stay safe. Stay safe. You know we can't afford to lose you, so you know keep yep. your health in a top shape. And uh, you know we look forward to hearing all of your your new ideas and 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 see how your work's going to develop. And I know I will. So appreciate you uh, talking with us and taking some time out of the day. And uh, anytime you want you want to come on and talk or just you know, feel questions right. from us, like uh, that'd be great. We really appreciate the support, and you have it back anytime you like. Oh, great. And I just want to say thank you as well. Uh, just been great seeing you out here doing uh, doing all your work, catching on the YouTube videos, Phil Dobby podcast. And thank you so much for coming oh, yeah. on and having a convo with us. So it means a lot.